one of the things that we do is to take a full size measurement at certain places along the boat. In this boat, it coincides with every sawn frame. So I find them, I label them. Every other frame in this boat is a steam bent rib, but we don't need to see it quite that often. So we did it every station, which is roughly two feet. We use this kind of a device as part of the measuring process that surrounds the boat, only one half of the boat because it's symmetrical. I have already chosen this side of the boat because it's the most fair. Okay. So we use that and we measure all, every part, the seams, the deck seams, the little molding, the height, the angle, the uh, gunnel, the shape of the hull, position of the chine, and the bottom. So we can go underneath there. We go underneath all the way to the keel. And then we transfer all of those measurements onto a piece of white plywood. So all 13 stations, we just finished about an hour and a half ago. <laughs> and all of the stations are superimposed on this piece of paper, on this uh, plywood, excuse me. So when I get back to my drawing board, I'll show you a, 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 a product. This is at half scale because of portability. But this is what I'll produce. And this is a typical line drawing. In order to build a boat, you have to see it in three views. You see the profile. You see what we call the half breadth. We only use half because a boat is symmetrical. So if you do it correctly, one side's a mirror image of the other. So we only have to measure half of the width. And then the other view is called the body plan, which is like an MRI of the boat. And so we slice it up into all of these sections. There were 13 for this boat. And we only have to see from the bow to the widest point on half of the drawing. And then we see from the widest point to the transom. So it's a matter of economy. And over here are all of our measurements. And this is called the table of offsets. And it says the measurements are given in feet, inches, and eighths to the outside of the planking. So if you see any of these, there's a series of three numbers. Here we have three, four, one, three, six, one, excuse me. That means three feet, six inches, and one eighth. And it's divided up into heights and widths. Now, back to high school geometry, we had an X and a Y axis. And the X is the center line, so we have heights, mm -hmm. and the Y is the water line. Mm -hmm. So if we go out on the water line and up on the center line and we make a dot, that's an important thing. So we've done that. All of these are measured, and they're all dots, and we connect the dots. And if you've done it right, the same measurement in this drawing and this drawing and this drawing coincide with the same point. And when that happens, and it doesn't happen without a little bit of going back and forth between the long lines, the short lines, the long lines, the short lines, and eventually you produce something that's called fair. And when it's fair, it's buildable, and it looks like a boat, and it's not crooked, and it has no humps and lumps and bumps. Gotcha. Um, how do you physically take the lines? And this is new for me also. I haven't been able to spend a lot of time in the boat shop down here while you've been working the past two weeks. So if you were to physically go take a line at one of these 13 points, sure. how are you measuring it? I've noticed these devices where the string is hanging over the side of the boat. Okay. The string hanging over the side of the boat is a plumb bob, which is as ancient a device as you can have. Moment. So while Ken's digging out the plumb bob, which is a fun word, I'll give you a quick background. The boat that he's been working on is Comet. 
Um, it was donated to the museum by Roger Hamblin. It is a 1926 um, race boat built by Stanley in Cape Vincent, New York, which is just up the road from us. And she is in unrestored condition. This is not a project to restore Comet. This is a project to take the line. Her um, original condition is an important part of her story. So we're taking the lines off of her and the end goal will to be have these lines drawing that so that someone else might be able to build a modern version of Comet. So I just wanted to introduce this lovely lady who's um, almost 100 years old who's still with us here on the river. So now Ken's going to get back to the plumb bob and the string here. Well, you can see on the floor a tape measure. It's zero is at the very stem of the boat, also called the forward perpendicular, which means if you built a box exactly the length of the boat, this boat would slip right into it. So we have a forward perpendicular, we have an aft perpendicular, and then we have stations. This happens to be uh, frame seven, which is our station seven. And if I want to know the width, I have to know how far from the bow station seven is. So if I drop this plumb bob, it tells me it is, I could wait for it to settle, but it's basically 12, four and a half. Okay. So I make a table of every uh, station and what the length is from the forward perpendicular. Then we measure out, okay, with another device and there's the chine. And so I can tell you how far from the center line it comes out from that. Okay. I use several different devices, none of which are particularly high-tech. The one high-tech um, instrument I do use is a laser. And this, you can see, is focused on the water line. Yeah. Now, this boat has three water lines, and it's a little bit of archaeology to decide what sequence they were put on and why they were put on. This boat has had two power plants, it's had two different cockpit configurations, and it's been through a little series of neglect, and the accommodation for the second engine kind of compromised uh, the main stringer, so there's a little sag. Okay. So rather than worry about the sag, we just drew a new water line. Yeah. So now I've determined that the the main stringers on the inside and this water line are parallel. One's higher than the other, but they're still parallel. Mm -hmm. I chose that as the base because boats are generally, boats like this are generally built upside down on the engine stringers. Mm -hmm. So chances are those were level when construction started. And this is very much in line it's just a matter of tweaking, raising it here and there, dropping it here and there. It takes a little time, but we decided that this is what we're going to call water level. Okay. And then the other part of this device is a vertical line. And we use it to align this tool right here. You can focus on the end here. Yeah. Okay. We also use levels to make sure that we're in the same place every time relative to the center line and the baseline. And if we are, that's all good. Obviously, you can't just have this any old place you want it. It has to be dialed in to the same spot on the floor every time because the boat is something that's in midair. Okay, and we're just extracting that shape out of midair mm -hmm. and, and putting it on the plywood. Mm -hmm. And you can see we drew the... the uh, Actually, you can't see it on, you see it on, oh, I didn't, I didn't do a very good job, but you can see that we drew a water line yep. and that this laser is right on that. So if it's not because of the, uh, because of the floor, we put a shim under it and make sure that that's at the right place every time. I was going to say, you have to make sure that your boat shop is level in order, it would seem. You have to make sure this is level. Okay. And it could be a cement floor, wood floor, as it so happens. This floor is as level as anything I've worked on because it's only a sixteenth of an inch difference between uh, the point zero and the overall length at 24 feet 7 and 3 quarter inches. Okay. So that was a very... So the old stone building's doing okay in that regard. The old stone building has a, has a good floor. <laughs> good. 
Um, what kind of challenges, if any, have you run into during the Comet project? Um, the little bit that I know, because she is in an unrestored original condition, for example, she doesn't have a transom. And I think that I had heard you were doing some kind of propping up work back there to help understand what the natural line would have been. Well, I explained one of the, one of the challenges was to find what's level. And so this is uh, a, a, uh, just a string tied from front to back. I've used the laser in here and I've also put a level across here. Uh, it was a nice idea because there was no transom on it. There was also, the, this was all quite loose and the fastenings had been removed so this planking was kind of, you know, an inch away and, and very strange shape. As you can see, and I added a few fastenings, but I put in the old ones. As you can see, this comes back remarkably close and it joins. And yes, there's a crack here, but the integrity, if you don't use it as a boat, if we're just trying to, if we're just trying to uh, restore a shape to measure it, um, we got it. This, P it did come back, right it did come back, yeah. okay? But you can see how much oil is everywhere in the boat. All the darkness around the bungs, that's all oil that's okay. coming through. And all the blackness that you see is oil. And that could have come through some catastrophic uh, motor failure. It could have come from an improper venting of, of an oil tank. Or it could have come from, uh, you know, the boat filling up with water and the oil in the bills just rose up and coated the interior. Yeah. It's hard to know. This is a challenge. There were three center lines. The center line of the deck frame is here. The center line of the king plank, which is here, is there. And the center line of the keel is there. So the, there, so you decide which one you're gonna use. <laughs> I decided to use the first piece of wood okay. as the center line, figuring that when a boat is set up, people are the most conscientious about what's plumb and level. Okay. Another challenge was, of course, the water line, which I've just described. Yeah. Um, what was unique, or what do you find unique about this boat, Comet? Well, the shape is certainly unique. The uh, this is this is an extreme shape for a transom and a transition into the top size. This is virtually, virtually a barrel back transom. So it is one curve, not necessarily a circle, but one continuous curve across the top and down the other side. Was in that my, common in, for that time period? No, or was it, no, it was no. kind of ahead of its time it for that kind shape? It was ahead of its time. Yeah. Another very unique part is the, the construction methods indicate that there was an overall desire to have a very lightweight hull. So for instance, you can't see, but there's no battens under these uh, planks. There's nothing between here. Yeah. And you can see that there is in the bottom. Yeah. So this see, is this battens and also yeah. look at all the fat this is rivets. Yeah. But look at all the pairs that you that are between the frames. Yeah. And out here between the frames, there's another three pair of fastenings from the inside out. So this boat probably weighed less an engine, probably weighed a little over a ton, maybe 22, 2300 pounds. And it had a World War I aircraft engine in it, which the core of the engine would weigh 400 pounds. And now you have to have the gearbox and the shaft and the prop and the exterior rudder. So it begins to gain weight, but still, uh, this is very lightweight construction. This is quarter inch, unsupported quarter of an inch. So you didn't walk around on I was this say, deck. You shouldn't be walking on that no, deck then. No, I don't think, I, I, I don't see any indication that it was ever broken. Yeah. And the deck seams are very, very lightly done. You can see there's just a V groove in each piece, but they're simply butt joined. See, there's nothing, there's no cement, there's no caulking, there's yeah. no nothing. Okay. Interesting. Uh, it's got very stylish windshields and you know we wonder 
who decides on certain shapes. And there's one thing that I think is worth, I think is worth noting. Uh, this device will copy the shape of, let's say, the deck, okay? That's not the way to do it, but that's the way to do it right now. <laughs> okay, so this is basically the shape of the deck beam, okay? Now, if I take the, if I were to build a boat and I said, what do we do for a, a windshield? I'd take the deck beam and I'd lay it up here at an angle. Yep. And I'd say, well, hmm, that's an interesting shape. And then I'd say, well, what does the bottom of the windshield look like? Well, maybe it's not exact, but it's an interesting process. Yeah. Okay. And lo and behold, you get almost the same shape at the top of the windshield. So, almost. Yeah. So it's a question of using one curve to do two or three different things. Yeah. Or as a basis. That's all. It also had minimum hardware, which also keeps the weight down because all this hardware is, is quite heavy. So we do actually have people listening to us and Juan just chimed in with a question. He just joined in, so he didn't hear me say what year Com it is. She's in 1926, and what's her overall length? 24 feet, seven and three quarters. 24 feet, seven and three quarters. Excluding the outboard rudder. Okay, so her rudder and would I have extended. I measured that separately, but her outboard rudder is probably um, probably nine to ten inches, and then the out exterior bracket adds another uh, two to three, so twenty-seven and three quarters plus about twelve or thirteen. Okay, so that gives you one an um, idea of what her overall length would be. And it's only six feet wide, so it's very narrow. I'll kind of I'll go up to the front to the bow here, guys, and kind of show you this bow view to give you an idea of her width overall. Um, probably should climb up on the step ladder to see the Oh, I bet I could do that. Um, Ken, can you talk about, so you've been working here in our stone building for two weeks, a little over two weeks. Um, we hope you've had fun working on the project. What have you enjoyed about this Comet project? Well, I certainly enjoyed the, the atmosphere. You know, this is the classic old building and a classic old boat so what's not to like about that and all the signs of all the old equipment that was in this building is still intact up in the air um, I also must say you know I generally work alone or with you know one other person but uh, I talked to an awful lot of people <laughs> in the last two weeks and some very interesting stories emerged yeah. and I talk to school children. I, I used to be a secondary school teacher myself, so I don't have any problem <laughs> talking. And when it came time to apply high school geometry, it was surprising how many people nodded their head. I said, remember the mm -hmm. X and Y and the Z that goes right down the middle? And they all said, yes. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you could bring this project really to people that had really no uh, no boating experience yep. or things like that. So that was kind of a surprise of how um, how you can communicate a pretty sophisticated, specialized job to uh, museum goers. Um, you were mentioning how you take the measurements, and I'm still learning, so correct me when I say something wrong, the three points and you want them to match up. What happens if they don't match up? What do you do? Okay. There's several reasons why they might not match up. It's that you measured wrong, or you transmitted the measurement improperly okay. from that to this, okay? Yeah. Then you have to, what's literally, we work back and forth between the long lines and the short lines. These are the short lines. These are the sections. The long lines are the 27-foot lines. Yeah. And so it's easy to move one of those because they're so long and gradual. It's not so easy to move this because it has really tight curves. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, you note what you found here, what you found there, it's all kinds of little notes. It's tedious in that you have to remember. Mm -hmm. People would say, why don't you use a computer? And I say, 
you can use a computer, but the computer lacks one major feature in my estimation, and that is judgment. Mm -hmm. If you give a computer three points, it wants to make a circle. Mm -hmm. It doesn't want to start out easy and get tighter and tighter. It doesn't want to do that. You have to give the computer many, 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 many points. I've chosen the points as the plank seams. Okay. So when I draw this. How do you, how do you choose where your points are going to be? Is that natural? Well, that's what I did. The is the, I just chose okay. the plank seams. See them here? Yeah. Okay. And I also know where they are at the stem because I've also superimposed the stem shape right here. Yeah. And I can tell you that's a plank, and I can tell you that's the first plank. Oh, this is the first plank here. Yeah. Second, third, fourth, fifth. This. So, and you see this light line here? They come in closer. See that light line? Yeah. That is the shape of the first plank out. Okay. Because here are the line. Here's the dots from doing that. Now this one is a little off. And I just circled it. But in general, that line is fair and it connects certainly most of the dots from 13 all the way down to 9, 8, and this is 10, 11, 12, and, and uh, 13. Yep. So this, this probably will wind up being up in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that will work the same. You can see this row. See that row? Yeah. That's going to be a plank seam. And see this? Oh, here's a great here's a great example. So the bow comes along, the plank seam comes along here, and then it turns into the stern. Okay. All right. I so see. if you have a if you have the skill to visualize, you can see the shape of the boat even though it's only on in two dimensions. Yeah. Um, that's really. I think that if I learned more about it, I would like a process like this. I. I feel like I'm a very linear mind, and if I could follow and make sure my numbers are accurate, I, it, to me it seems like you're kind of reconstructing a puzzle without knowing what the picture is, you, although you do That's have the exactly, boat right here. That's the, exactly. The picture reveals itself. Here's the chine, and it comes down from 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7 to 8 to 9 to 10 to 11, 12, 13. Beautiful. So it says the widest part of the boat is at station 9. Okay. At the chine, the widest part of the boat at the shear is six. Yep. Okay. It also says that the transom at 13 is narrower than the widest point. That's an old style of boat design. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, the transom is always that uh, generally wide as wide point. as the yeah. widest point. And that's what gives her that barrel back kind of tucked in shape at the transom? Uh, so, yes and no. Okay. That's the, that's the, how top the top part. sides roll into the transom. Okay. Okay. But this point, um, this point for boats this era, the width of the transom is about 90% of the overall width. Okay. And the overall width and the overall volume of the boat was forward where the major weight was, the engine, the fuel, the oil, the batteries. Yeah. Okay, so that's why um, these things got shaped the way they did, just to carry the weight where they needed to carry it. Now, you mentioned she had a, was it a World War I engine in a it? A World War I Hispano Suiza aircraft engine. Okay. They were very plentiful after the war. Uh, the skill to marinize them was pretty well known by 1926 yep. when this was marinized by the boat's owner. And uh, it ran about 54 miles an hour in 1926, which was uh, certainly national class uh, speed. And yeah. It could have competed in a, in a greater arena than locally, but it didn't, apparently. So it was very well known on the St. Lawrence and it was very well known on Cranberry Lake over its lifetime. Yep. Now what will you do? You're, this is actually Ken's last day with us um, of his in-shop work. What is your process when you pack up and you go home? Um, what's next in the project? <laughs> <laughs> After a you know cold beverage and a rest. <laughs> well, I reduce this. I reduce this to one inch scale, which means one inch equals one foot. Okay. So, this drawing, well, I'll tell you, I'll <laughs> show you. 
before I reduce the drawing, I take all of that, remember the table of offsets with all the numbers on it? Yeah. Let's just take the center line. So I would start at the baseline, which I'm going to make it be uh, the lowest part of the boat, which is station six and seven. Yeah. Okay. And I am going to put this on the baseline and I'm going to measure where each station, the heights of each station where it crosses. So I would say at six and seven, it is zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. I would say at five, it is zero feet, zero inches, and one eighth. Okay. And I would make this table and it would be just that thing. So I would make a, one for the center line, a buttock line will be out here, another one here, another one here. So 13 times three, there's 39 measurements. Yep. Now I go to water lines. This is the load water line at 13. I'll do another one at six, and another one at 18, another one at uh, 26. Yep. Times 13. And all of those spots. So all of those. Then when that's done, I have my table. Mm -hmm. Now I will use just the numbers, walk away from that, use just the numbers to draw it at one inch scale. And you hand draw. Hand draw, yep. number three pencil. There you go. I know it could have a computer do it, but I learned uh, before computer. Yep. I have worked with computers and people that operate computers. Chances of having someone that's good with a computer know about the nuances of boats are slim. And this is not racing sailboats, this is not state of the art, this is history. Mm -hmm. So uh, the old school way of measuring a boat matches the, <laughs> the old school builder and the, mm -hmm. and the old school boat. Yeah. So, and it would take about the same amount of time. If you were to build this boat uh, right now, it would probably be 1,000 man hours, which is the same as it took back in the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it surprises people, but basically, um, we we operate at about the same speed that everyone did back mm -hmm. in the day. How long will it take you? Um, you know, I'm to not finish? sure. What, yeah, what other projects you have going on? But you know, the all that work that you're taking home with you to put together, so we so we end up with the table of measurements and it's, the one inch I scale. I don't. I don't have a firm number because I'm not. I know this. I know I'm going to have problems in a couple of places. Yeah. So I have to resolve that. But I've already uncovered some of the issues. Um, it's going to take um, uh, three weeks. Yeah. Four weeks. Three weeks of time. Okay. You know, work time. Yeah. Work time. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of tracing. I can't erase. So once everything is the way it is, I trace it all. Mm -hmm. So it looks like I got it right the first time. <laughs> Backtrack a little. <laughs> um, when you say that you know you're gonna, there's some spots that are gonna give you problems, mm -hmm. how do you go about resolving those problems? Are you interpreting everything else that's going on in the boat and try to interpret of, okay, exactly. this is how the original boat builder was, Ex I think how exactly. he intended to exactly. do it. Okay. Was there damage in that area? No, I mean, it, the, we've already been through that yeah. to say, well, why is that shape weird? And one of the weird shapes is right here. If I look down the shear, which is there, do you see this line right there? Yeah, I'll line? come over closer. It kind of wiggles. Well, it does kind of wiggle, but I recorded it as I saw it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there's a couple of couple of little discrepancies. But I'm gonna I am going to record. This is what the way I found it. Yep. And. As I begin to ferret, I will find out what is. I'll find out what the what the real what the real curve is or close to or something, and that's what I'll represent. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. Now, when do you when you're starting this process? I wasn't down here when you were first started. Like, how soon do you move toward putting your points on the big white piece of plywood? Well, it's taken almost uh, two weeks. Uh, I just started doing the plywood yesterday. Oh, okay. So in two right. days, um, basically 13 stations. Okay. But prior to that, I photographed all come this way. Yep. I photographed all the deck hardware. 
which means, and I also put it in the box, labeled the box, but here's the instrument panel. Here's the cup water. Here's the deck vent. Okay. So I've photographed it and measured it in three views. So no matter where it's presented on the drawing, I can draw it to scale. Yeah. Okay. Spotlight. light. There's a, a spotlight. that's a spotlight, a spotlight and this is a deck vent. Okay. And this is a stem head fitting with a fair lead. Yep. And so on and so on. So all of that got photographed and measured. And yep. then, well, these pieces right here, there's a deck patch. Okay. And there's some seat structure. Yep. And in this box, there's part of the transom. Okay, yep. And there's a dashboard. And the ceiling pieces. Now, I'm not really doing a lot of detail for the interior because my uh, my uh, thrust is meant to record the shape. Mm -hmm. And it'll have certainly all the cover boards will be easily defined. The combings, the seat back, the windshields, and the rail and how that changes, and then the shape. Um, it's just, it, as I'm like listening and I'm learning right along uh, some other people, folks who are watching might know more than me, um, it's like boat forensics. It's like you came to a boat crime scene almost and you're putting back together reading the clues and reassembling history that's right. exactly right it's and you must have to be extremely well organized well you have it's a tedious a lot of it is tedious and uh, you have to be very clear when you write notes to yourself yeah very clear um, that's my third notebook in my career and um uh, I'd say the system, I, I, I know <laughs> I know where I've messed up in the past and yep. I'm just, you know, you constantly refine and refine. Uh, I think preparation to center line and the, the way the boat is presented is key. Finding the relationship between the interior structures and the overall uh, the water line on the boat is important. Uh, yeah, it's these are things I just sort of take for granted, but I've you've, been you've been doing it a long time. I've been doing this quite a long time. I was immediately interested in in uh, boat design before I knew anything, and I put myself in a library chair and went to work. Stayed there until I learned. It's wonderful. Um, we've been very um, proud and happy and grateful to have Ken here in our stone building. He talked a little bit about working in this environment. I'll kind of swing the camera around so the um, EJ Noble Historic Stone Building as it is now um, called is our last remaining original building on the museum campus that was original to the Brooks Lumberyard that was here so it's a beautiful um, if you've ever been to campus it's a beautiful limestone building um, it is cool in the summertime I don't think it's particularly warm in the wintertime but it's definitely cool in the summertime we have three projects being hosted in here right now um, and everyone is be, has been great neighbors and kind of sharing the workspace. We have had Comet here um, at the north end of the building. Over here at the west end we've got one of our museum volunteer projects, a Chris Craft, and over here on the east side of the building in the back you can see a shiny boat. Um, that is another volunteer project that we're calling the photo op boat. It's actually a fiberglass boat that we're going to place out on the grounds that our visitors can um, take a picture, take a photo op in. So the stone building is our living exhibit space and whether it's our volunteers working in here or our boat right or a visiting boat builder like Ken Bassett, um, it's as Ken mentioned, um, he's only been here about two weeks and he's doing very intricate work that you have to you know, be able to focus on but we're grateful that he's been able to share his time. Um, John Kadamick says, hi, Kenny. Um, hi, John. Um, to share his time, it's, it's always a balance. And if you talk to anyone who's worked in our stone building, you come into work to try to get work done, but part of the work is also talking with our visitors and explaining what's going on, and it really helps bring the history alive. All of what Ken is doing here is keeping um, this traditional 
um, skill, these traditional skills and craftsmanship alive, doing the same things that someone was doing right up the road um, in Cape Vincent almost a hundred years ago. And it's amazing and we're so proud to be the site of keeping this history alive um, right here on the St. Lawrence River. So I just, I think it's so neat to think about. We're still doing it right here a hundred years later. Um, anything else you think I've missed, Ken, that someone should know about this Comet project, um, about how you take lines, about you know what you've gone through and what you will go through? I'm just kind of showing the boat a little bit more. I think we had a good little video. This is our first time we've done kind of a little shop talk like this, and I'm grateful that Ken was able to carve out some time for us. Um, we didn't have as many live viewers as I was hoping. We had around 20, I think, at our peak, but this video will go on our Facebook page and it will stay up there so folks can watch it at a later time. If they have any questions at a later time, they can put them in the comment section and I know how to get a hold of Ken and we can get some questions answered. Um, Comet, I think, is going to stay on display in the stone building at least for a little while during the summer, as far as I know. Do you think you'll have to make any return trips to visit her again? Well, you never know, but uh, I'm certainly not above <laughs> driving back if I miss something. Yep. Not above it. Yep, wonderful. All right. Ronald Ellis says, great job. Thanks, Ronald, for listening in. Thank you to everyone else who has listened in. Um, this is Comet. She's a beautiful river lady. I'm going to walk down her length one more time, kind of give you an idea. Just a reminder, this is not a restoration project. Um, she will remain as is for the time being. She's in an unrestored original state. Um, that's important for her history. We'd like to preserve that original state history. Not every boat that's at the Antique Boat Museum is, you know, 100% super shiny restored. Um, some of our boats are in original condition and we want to stabilize them so they can remain that way. Um, Comet will be on display in the stone building for the time being. I'll give you a little shot of, we've got a great dashboard sign over here. Oh, that's also what I wanted to show, some images of her, some historic images of her back in the day. So this is Comet back in the day, some nice black and white um, photos. Um, she was sold um, and was renamed the Fox. Um, so she was originally uh, built for ba -ba 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 -ba, Charles Parker. He was a boat designer. I'll kind of share our information on our sign here. A well-known boat designer and automotive engineer um, and he was converting aviation engines and putting them into race boats, which many people were doing after World War I, as Ken mentioned. Um, so Comet was built in 1926 for Mr. Parker and was powered by a Hispano Suiza. And Mr. Parker raced her here on the St. Lawrence River. Um, and there's a rumor that she uh, raced and may have beaten um, the Baby Gar snail, which is in our museum collection also. And Stanley Boat Works was located in Cape Vincent, New York. They built skiffs, powered guide boats, and runabouts. Um, this is the only Stanley boat in our museum collection. Um, so just one more shot to close off our day in our kind of little afternoon in the shop. So this is Comet, later known as the Fox. And thank you to Ken Bassett. This is his last day. He's hard at work getting ready to go home to Vermont. So thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you, Ken. You're welcome. All right. See you later, guys.